So my, my text verse is coming out of 1 Corinthians. Um, I took the title, Faith, Hope, and Love, and the greatest of these is love. So look at somebody and say, the greatest of these is love. <laughs> and, and it's not just um, our kind of love, it's the Jesus kind of love. Because I said that, right, that he gave us a new commandment, not a new suggestion. Not just to love one another, but he said, love one another as I have loved you. That's not easy. So let's ask the Lord to help us. Lord, as we open up your word, we pray you would feed us. Our, our souls need to be fed with the truth of your word, Lord. We want to be restored and renewed, and we want to leave here different than the way we walked in. So help us to break open the bread of life and receive the nourishment that you have for us today. So in the beginning of the, the verse, it says in verse 9 in 1 Corinthians 13, gifts of knowledge and prophecy are partial at best, at least for now, but when the perfection and fullness of God's kingdom arrive, all parts will end. Okay, so we believe our theology is that that means the second coming of Christ. Okay, so these gifts that we have now are in part. How many are filled with the Holy Spirit? Okay, so you realize that that, that is the essence of the very creator of the whole universe. Right? If you had to boil down the essence of God, it's his spirit. It's the same spirit that we read about in Genesis that was hovering over the earth when everything was just in chaos and only darkness, right? And when you meditate on the fact that that same spirit is living on the inside of you, it, it's really hard to grasp that he would love us that much. In the Old Testament, they would go to the temple and the presence of God would be in the temple. And now after the resurrection and when the Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost, you and I are now the temple. That's a pretty big demand, I would say, to be ye holy, the Bible says, as I am holy. So he doesn't want us to be carnal Christians. That's a contradiction. Yet we could become legalistic Christians if we try too hard to do it in our own works. So I keep this up here to remind us that the King of Kings was washing the disciples' feet the night before he was crucified, okay? And he said, I'm doing this as an example for you that the greatest title in the kingdom is servant. And this foot washing piece is the lowest rung on the social ladder in their culture. Only the, the, the servant in the house that had the lowest position would do this job. And yet Jesus is saying, if you want to be great in my kingdom, you learn how to serve. So this verse is important because... The gifts of knowledge and prophecy are partial, but we have them, right? The Bible calls the Holy Spirit, the way that we have the Holy Spirit now, it's called a down payment. It's a partial payment on what the future will be like, in part, but when, when he returns and we rule and reign with him for eternity, we'll have the fullness of the Spirit. Right now, it's held in a sinful vessel, but as we live holy before the Lord, and as I quoted from 2 Corinthians 3.18, we are being transformed into the image of God with ever-increasing glory. So if you're a Christian and it's feeling like things have slowed down a little bit, or you, you feel like you might have uh, hit, a, hit, a, hit a ceiling and you haven't been growing, we want to pray for you, because that should never be our condition as a Christian. We should be in a position that we wake up in the morning and we're excited to see what the Lord is going to do with us today, right? Paul said, these light and momentary afflictions are nothing in comparison to the glory that's going to be revealed in us. Even when you're taken out, and when I tell you, I was there yesterday pulling out <laughs> pallets full of wet diapers. Like, so if you ever wanted to know if diapers are absorbent, they're really absorbent. <laughs> Because they don't weigh much when the box is, you know, when, it's, when they're dry. But all that water that came in there, I mean, boxes of cereal and all this oatmeal and mashed potatoes. And it's one thing when they're dry, but when they're wet, oh, my God, it's so much heavier. And yet all these people they had worship music on. They were praising the Lord while we were cleaning out the place. It was just a beautiful picture of the kingdom and not being the victim, right? Like, God will get us through this. He's done it too many times before to let the enemy rob our joy. But this is important because we only have a part of what we're going to have in full when he returns. But use the part that you have. Right. right? Operate in the gifts. Paul said you could covet the gifts. That's the one thing we're allowed to say, Lord, I want more. 
I want to have clearer insight into, into the prophetic gift that you've given me. And he says, when I was a child, I spoke, thought, and reasoned in childlike ways, as we all do. But when I became an adult, I left my childish ways behind me. For now, we can only see a dim and blurry picture of things compared to what we will see. As when we stare into a polished metal, I realize that everything I know is only part of the big picture. And that's another point I want to make today, because the greatest of these is love, right? Faith, hope, and love, the greatest of these is love. So often, we're in our interactions in the course of a day, and we're bumping into people along the way. We get a waitress who's a little harried right now. Anybody serve tables? I mean, this is a really hard time, because people aren't showing up for work. Um, the, the extended unemployment was really keeping a lot of people home, right? So if you run a restaurant, it's not easy. And you're trying to serve the same amount of tables with less people and maybe less qualified. So really, if we're Christians, are we going to take it out on the waitress that the food was cold? Like, have you ever been out to lunch with, with Christians after church and they're getting rude with the waitress? Like, you just spent two hours worshiping the Lord and reading the Bible and praise God. And, and now it's like her fault. She's not the chef. She's the waitress. Like, Let's not give her a hard time. My wife used to work at, at uh, LaGuardia Airport behind the ticket counter, and people would get mad at her because the flight was delayed. Wow. It's like it's weather-related, man. I'm not that good. I can't control the weather. Like, why are you getting mad at me? I'm just giving you your ticket. But, but that kind of annoyance is not rational. Right. So when we operate in this other kingdom in the midst of all the really you know, stressed-out people around us, it's like, what's different about you? It's because I'm walking in a different kingdom. I'm walking in the earthly kingdom, but I'm operating in the kingdom of God in the earth. And that's why he was so encouraging to us in, in the uh, Beatitudes when he said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. It doesn't mean he wants you to be poor in spirit. It means when you are poor in spirit, you have access to the resources of the kingdom. And what is that? That's the body of Christ. That's us. Blessed are those who mourn. For they shall be comforted by the body of Christ. It's not that you're blessed because you're mourning because you lost somebody. It's blessed because the kingdom is available to you through the body of Christ. But if the body of Christ is not fully operating in the, in the potential that God has for us, then we're not fully blessing people the way we could be. And it all starts with this, this truth. Uh, the greatest of these is love. Faith, hope, and love. The greatest of these is love. And you can't put on different spectacles. You've got to have the spectacles of Jesus when you look at people. And when they're getting all angry and up in your face, you say, Lord, there must be a big problem in this guy's life. And I don't want to respond to his violence with more violence, right? I mean, I love the picture of Malchus. He gets his ear cut off. He's a Roman soldier, right? One of the guards. I think Jesus just picked it up and went like this slapped it back on and it was healed and it's like you mean you'd even heal the people that are coming to take you to crucify you think of the the cognitive disconnection that would be there you know like you're there to get this guy one of one it was peter right that took the sword and jesus is like peter put the sword away ears back on what the heck just happened and and you're gonna let us now just take you and crucify you and you can do that different kingdom different kingdom. Jesus was here not to die on the cross. He came to defeat death. He had to die on the cross, but he didn't defeat death until he rose from the dead. Okay? That's what Easter is about, not the cross, the resurrection. And Paul said, without the resurrection, your faith is futile. Don't even bother believing without that, but I believe it. How about you? He literally rose from the dead. He appeared to 500 people. And then went to heaven, and when his blood was shed on the mercy seat in heaven, boom, Holy Spirit is released. And now he says, it's good that I go because when I go, the comforter will come. And we just don't always fully appreciate these gifts that they're talking about here that God gave us, not for our own benefit. I really don't believe it. I think we do get a benefit from it. But when our thinking is others-minded, right, consider the needs of others above yourselves, the Bible says. That's what the love that he's talking about is. That's what, exactly what he modeled for us. I want you to love one another the way I love you. Not a suggestion. 
a new commandment. Okay, that's a little review. <laughs> Everything I know now is only part of the big picture. So, like I said, if you're just in the middle of your day and you go into a, a grocery store and the person behind the counter is a little bit rude to you, maybe Jesus is saying, I want, to give, I want you to give that person a word. I have a word for them and I want you to open your mouth and I'll fill it. That's ris risky, right? I'm going to look silly. Well, the guy's just miserable behind the counter. Like, how, his day's not going to get worse if I give him a word, but it could get a lot better if God's speaking to me. And that's how we're supposed to live, with that kind of awareness of the kingdom around us. And that's what Paul's saying here. He says, one day when Jesus arrives, we will see clearly face to face. In that day, I will fully know just as I have been wholly known by God. Wow, what a verse. In that day when he comes, I will fully know, just as I have been wholly known by God. That's going to be an amazing day when he comes back. A lot of things are going to click. I don't know, anybody go to the eye doctor and they put that thing in front of you and they start clicking the lenses and you thought you were seeing it pretty clearly before and it's like, wow, what a difference. But <laughs> Probably the greatest way to sell a pair of eyeglasses ever, right? Like, and I thought I saw pretty good until you did that. Well, that's what's going to happen. But it can happen now. It can happen in this life while we're here. When we know what the calling is on our life, then we press in and we say, Lord, help me. You said that as the Father sent you, you're sending me. I have a goal. And one of the goals is the greatest of these is love. So look, like if you're serving at feeding hands, there's no payback. These people can't pay you back. They're just coming to pick up food. And because they qualify for it. And if they qualify for it, that means that they're really in a lot of need. Here, hold on one second, sorry. And I'm only using that as an example because not everybody here is called to serve and feeding hands. I get that. But, I mean, it is important that you know what the vision of the church is, that we don't, we don't think that our life is complete just when we come together and meet in church services. As great as that is, if we're not applying that in our weekly, daily living, we're missing the boat, right? It's got to translate into the way we love people when we're out of here, all right? So verse 13 says, but now faith, hope, and love remain. These three virtues must characterize our lives. The greatest of these is love, okay? So you already knew that. You've heard that verse. I want to go to Luke 14. Now it happened as he went into the house of one of the rulers of the Pharisees to eat bread on the Sabbath that they watched him closely. I'm guessing most of you have read this, right? And you know this story. So think about Jesus and, and the way he loved people. If he went into the house of the Pharisee, is that showing love? Yes, because they were openly hostile towards him. And when it says they were watching him, there was a, a tension in the air because it was on the day of the Sabbath. And, and there was always like a feeling when Jesus was around the Pharisees that they were trying to trap him except that before Abraham was, I am, <laughs> right? So they couldn't trap him. <laughs> you know, they didn't believe him when he said that, but it's true. Uh, he never pulled rank on anybody. He lived and met people where they were at, and instead of giving them a shaming answer, which he easily could have done, and there are times that he clearly was very angry with the Pharisees, yet he did not sin. So you can be angry and not sin, but how many know you can be angry and sin? <laughs> Been there. <laughs> know about that one. So Jesus was able to walk that line, and even though he was saying, woe to you Pharisees, woe to you scribes, things aren't going to end up well for you, he didn't sin in, in, in doing that. So we just have to keep that in mind, that you don't want to be the angry John the Baptist guy out in the public, giving everybody your opinion about what they should be doing, because you don't have authority to do that. Jesus did. But love wins. So they have this armor plating to protect themselves, and a lot of their frustrating behavior is because they don't have peace inside, but that when they meet somebody with peace, it can be contagious if there's the right combination to the lock of their heart, and God will give that to you. So it says, they watched him closely, and behold, there was a certain man before him who had dropsy, and I love this, it says, and Jesus answering. What does that mean? Nobody asked the question. What's he answering? You ever been in a meeting like this? You walk into a conference room full of people and they just had an argument and you walk in and they all kind of look down at their notes and 
It's like you can tell something's going on. And he knows what they're thinking. So he's going he's to answer the question before they even ask it. And they're, they're saying, is he going to heal this guy on the Sabbath? So, and I, I just wanted to put this little note in here. Jesus always considers the big picture. So this is really for us. When you walk into that situation, unexpected, right? Like in, when you pray in the morning, you don't know all the things that are going to happen to you in the course of that day. But you can say, Lord, keep my awareness open to when you open up opportunities for me, right? So Jesus isn't just thinking about the man that needs to be healed. He's also thinking about the Pharisees who don't like him. Because they're supposed to be running his father's business. <laughs> and they're not doing a good job of running the family business. And Jesus is here to show them the right way to do it. So if all he did was shame them, then he'd be operating in their spirit because that's what they did. They shamed people. Remember that man that was born blind and he got healed? And they were harassing the parents like, well, how do you know he was really healed? They're like, I don't know. I know he was born blind and I know he can see. Okay, like that's, that's it. That's what I know. Ask him. He's an adult. Right? And then they shame that guy because he's like, well, like I said, I left the house this morning. I was blind. Now I can see. I don't know who did it. I just know a man prayed for me and it's over. And I think he's from God. And they said, oh, well, he's not from God, blah, 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 blah. And the guy goes, well, that's pretty cool then because this, nowhere in Scripture does it say anybody open up the eyes of the blind and God answers the prayer of the righteous. And here's what they say. You're going to you're going to lecture us? You were born in sin and you're going to lecture us? Like, let's lose that attitude. That is not Jesus, okay? He never does that. And he could have done it easily. But he's thinking about the big picture. He resists that urge of playing one side against the other. He interacts in a way that both sides can learn. And I could give you many more examples of this, but just for today. They both can learn the kingdom rules of engagement. Okay, that's the way I like to think about it. Spiritual warfare, rules of engagement. If you get angry and you're hijacked in your emotions, you're not operating well in the kingdom rules of engagement. When you remain in peace, something changes. Because even though they're swirling and they're hijacked, you're not. And your peace can be contagious if you're listening and just praying in that moment and just asking the Lord. All right, so further it says, Jesus answering, which I already quoted, but I didn't give you the answer, spoke to the lawyers and the Pharisees saying, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? Right? They didn't ask, but he knew they were thinking it. So that's the question. They kept silent. And he took him, healed him, and let him go. Like, isn't that beautiful? It wasn't a three-hour prayer. He just took the man, healed him, and let the man go. Like, it was that easy for Jesus, operating in his gift to just heal this man. And he leaves. And then he answered them again, right? Like, they didn't ask a question yet, but he's answering. He said, which of you, having a donkey or an ox that has fallen into a pit, will not immediately pull him out on the Sabbath day? And they could not answer him regarding these things. Don't you love that? Every time they kept trying to trap him, it says over and over in the Bible, they stopped asking him any more questions after that. <laughs> Before Abraham was, I am, okay? Like, you guys don't have anything over on me. So let me just give you a, a picture here that I'm going to try to explain because I felt like the Lord wanted me to give you a little history on our church. That uh, obviously is a landscape design of our old property at 219 Mount Airy Road. Before we got the property, we had to go to the town and, and go through, you know, like I said, 18 miles of bad road. Like it was a lot of meetings and trying to get them to approve what we wanted to do and lots of questions and insulting things that were said to us. But... That's it. That's okay. We, we got it. We got the property. But we were coming out of a season where we had been out in the public, okay? And if you were here then, you, you know what I'm about to say. But we started the church in Basking Ridge Firehouse in October of 1999. And by August of 2000, we were meeting in the cafeteria at the Bernersville High School, okay? Uh, we left our prior church with their blessing, but no finances. So it was like, okay, hope you do well out there. <laughs> we'll tell people in Bernardsville. Uh, that you're out there, um, but and that was fine. We were good with that. We didn't mind that. So I kept working. So as I'm working the job, 
I was able to get my office for the finance company that I work for right in Bernardsville, downtown Bernardsville, and we opened up a cafe a little bit further down the block across from the train station. You might think, why would you do that? Because why wouldn't you take the money and save it up and buy a piece of land and build a property? Right? That would be a normal thing for churches to do. And why wouldn't you, instead of continuing to work for the finance company, why wouldn't you quit that job and go full-time in the church? Because couldn't you be more effective if you were full-time and not working? And that sounds very logical until you read Paul's letters. And he continued to make tents while he was a minister of the gospel. So that logic didn't apply to him. It doesn't mean everybody has to do it, but I have a really good example I can use right in the Bible of somebody who continued working, I, I think partly because he didn't want to lose touch with the lost. And if we're not careful, we could spend 100% of our time with Christians. And that's great for fellowship, but it's not so great to keep... I mean, the Bible said he doesn't want one person to perish and that we're supposed to love what he loves and he loves the lost sometimes more than we do but that's I would really love to see that change and that's partly the philosophy that we had because we were opening that cafe every day not Sundays but six days a week at five o'clock in the morning because the train station right the commuters are going coming to the train station to go into New York City and, and I worked that shift often because I, prior to that, was my family's in the garbage business. So I was up 4 o'clock working for them, right? That, if you probably don't know much about the garbage business. That's a good thing. But one thing is you get up really early in the morning. So that never left me. So I'm like, sure, I can handle that shift. My boss from the finance company would come in and get coffee from me at 8, and then I'd go to work at 9. <laughs> and he was fine with it. He's like, wow, this is a cool place. And the whole town knew about it. There was no Starbucks yet in Bernersville. And, and we were the cafe. We were where everybody came. And we met all of the unsafe people in the town. And it wasn't weird. And, you know, there was a little Christian bookstore in the middle. But it was just a coffee shop right in the front. And then we had evangelists in, in the church that would be bringing people in there and having a cup of coffee. And then walk them in the back, buy them a book, a Bible off the shelf. And then, and like, every day one guy would be in there witnessing to different people that was his gift that he operates and I know that's not all of our gifts but it was his and many people came to the Lord and many people came to our church through that and and you realized many things that and I can't go too far into the details but the thing that one of the things surprised me the most was just how lonely some so many people are and you know one man was an older man and he was getting cancer treatment and he was he had no family left he was probably in his late 70s, early 80s, and he would just come and sit and watch all the traffic coming in and out. And, you know, the cup of coffee would be getting cold. It wasn't about the coffee. He didn't want to be home alone. He, he was just out among the public, and there was life in this place, and there was joy, and all the people that worked behind the counter were Christians, and many of them were very gifted and were able to pray with people and give prophetic words. And, and these people didn't know what a prophetic word was, but they knew their shoulder was hurting. And they, they came for prayer, and, and often the discernment that we would have, it wouldn't, you wouldn't need a lot of discernment. I remember working there one day, and a lady walked in, and she stumbled over the step on the way in, and, and I, thought, I, I said to her, are you okay? And she looked at me, and she said, oh, I just found out one of my best friends just lost their son in a car accident. Their son was just killed in a car accident. And, and, and she was in shock, and I said, would it be okay if I pray with you? And she was like, yeah. What kind of coffee shop prays for you? You know, there's that, again, there's that disconnection, like, but why wouldn't we want to pray for you? Like, nobody ever says no. It's, it's very rare that people ever said no. It's because if they don't believe in it, then what do they got to lose? Another kid that was going to the Presbyterian Church in uh, New Providence was being harassed, he would, he would have said at the time, by one of his mother's friends because she wanted him to get saved. And he was a real secular kid, and he didn't want to hear anything about it, but he was a hockey player. And he badly dislocated his shoulder. So she said, come on, I just want to buy you a cup of coffee. And while we're there, I'll bring you in the back and they pray for people. And he's like, will you just get off my back about this? And it's like, it's a cup of coffee. It's a free cup of coffee. Come on. So she brings him there and he gets a cup of coffee. And she says, come on, let's go in the back. They want to pray for you. He walks in the back and one of our ministers that was there prayed over him. And he fell down under the power of the Spirit not knowing what that is, right? He had no idea what that was. Stands up, healed. Shoulders completely healed, okay? It's the demonstration of the power of God. I didn't come with fancy words. I came with the demonstration. When Trisha was talking about anybody here feeling sick, you should expect to get healed. That's who we serve. 
Resurrection can be a shoulder, right? Something that was dead comes back to life. And that he went full-time in Christian ministry himself. This kid that was the angry hockey player that had nothing to do with God, he's now working full-time for the Lord. All because a lady loved him enough to harass him, he would say, but to get him to come to that coffee shop and, and, and get coffee and prayer. And we lost a little bit of our edge when we moved into that building that I showed you because we weren't among the public like we were every day. And I don't think it was intentional that we lost it, but we just weren't around as many unsafe people. I was in the Chamber of Commerce. We started doing fundraising for the town. Uh, we, we had to open the cafe in 2004, had to close it in 2009 when the financial crisis hit. But I just want to share one more scene with you before because in the Chamber of Commerce, and, and I'll just give you a little dynamic about Bernardsville. The people that live up on the mountain, there's, there's estates up there that are worth $20 million, okay? I mean, there's some of the greatest wealth in the state up on the top of that mountain and Mendham and all. But when you come down to the, to the main road of 202 and there's the railroad right there, right on the other side of the tracks is a whole other population of people. And it's funny that it would be the other side of the tracks, right? Because that's what people will say. I, live, I lived on the wrong side of the tracks. But when we went to the Chamber of Commerce, we would get all the business in Bernardsville to, to donate food to this event that we called Unity Day. And we would take the park that's right there on 202, and we would set up inflatable rides. We got a pony ride around the place. The fire department would bring the pumper truck out, and they would let the kids sit on the pumper truck because we were raising money for them and for the police department. And, and one day when I went there, it was just the perfect summer day. The, the pumper truck was pumping and there was a rainbow in, in the cloud of water that was going, and Michael W. Smith's music was playing in the whole park. They didn't know it was Christian, but it was amazing that there were 4,000 people that came through that park that day that all got touched by the Lord without knowing it was even a Christian event. But the love was the difference. The greatest of these is love. You see what I'm saying? I'll never forget that day. It was the height of that ministry that we had because the rich and the poor were mingling together. And, you know, we used to see it in the cafe. The, the, many times it was women when I was working the shift, they'd have these big rock diamonds on their finger and they'd be ordering the fufu latte with extra pumps of this and that. And then the, the guy that's painting the house would be right behind him and, him, and, him and his friend that could barely speak English. They just want a regular cup of coffee, right? And... The, the two don't normally meet because the wealthy people can separate from that. We shouldn't be separating from them, right? So that's the rest of this, and I'll finish in the, in the Bible. We were in the meeting to get approved, and we were being insulted and harassed when I tell you. We really were. And I looked at this picture that was up there as one of the exhibits, and I felt the Lord say, I got this. And I saw a smiling face in this picture. Does anybody see it? Like, to see what I was like, oh, I don't have to worry about this anymore, Lord. We got this. And it was right at one of the most intense moments in, in the meeting where, I won't even go into why, but they just didn't think we needed another church. <laughs> Heard that before, too. So it's really just all in your perspective, right? It's not so much that the situation changed, is that God gave us peace in the midst of that. And, and how that fits today is because this is the new picture. It's not a smiley face, but this is what the barn is going to look like when we set it up right on this property as you go out. That first big building you see is the vision that God gave these people that they want to run this as a grocery store. Okay, it's not just going to be a place where you come and get handed food. You're going to be able to walk around with a cart and you're going to be able to pick whatever you need off the shelf. And then when you get to the checkout counter, you don't have to pay. You just give them your voucher there. And why do we do that? Because the greatest of these is love. These are the lost that we now have a chance to come in contact with. And, and if you're not demonstrating a non-church version of love, they don't want anything to do with church. They've been turned off by churches often. Not always, but often. You're just going to be the love of Jesus in the midst of the pain, and you're going to show this person unconditional love because they can't pay you back. Why would you do this? That's what they think. Why would you do this? Because somebody did it for me. And as I've been blessed, I want to be a blessing. And it's because you can never pay me back, Jesus says right here in Scripture. He told a parable. I keep putting this thing away. I keep missing it. There it is. Okay. 
So he told a parable to those who, were, those who invited him. He noted how they chose the best places, saying to them, when you're invited by anyone to a wedding feast, don't sit down at the best place, lest one more honorable than you be invited by him. And then the one who invited you comes and says to you, sorry, you got to give place to this man. Somebody with a higher rank came. And then you'll begin with shame to go to that lowest place. But when you're invited, go and sit in the back, sit in the lowest place, so that when he who invited you comes, he may say to you, friend, come up higher, come to a better spot. Then you will have glory in the presence of those who sit at the table with you. We could say it's just humility, right? That's a beautiful virtue of Christianity. Is It's the opposite of pride. We don't pull rank on people. We don't need to tell people we graduated from this school or that school and, and drop all these names of people that we know. That's what the world does. If there's, a, if there's an anointing on your life, you can't hide it. People will see it, right? Your gift will make room for you and bring you before great people. It's amazing how that happens. And then he said to them, the, to the man who invited, when you give a dinner or supper, don't ask your friends, your brothers, your relatives, your rich neighbors, lest they also invite you back and you be repaid. But when you give a feast, invite the poor, the maimed, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you. For you shall be repaid at the resurrection of the just. You don't always get a lot of amens on that verse because it doesn't seem like it makes a whole lot of logical sense that you would invite people that could never repay you. But it's the rules of engagement of the kingdom is what I'm trying to get across to you. So just another example. Um, and, you know, we were, we were very in tune um, with the fact that the people that were coming into the cafe did not know much about Bible, didn't know any Bible, many of them. But, you know, one lady came in and said, hey, that prayer thing you got, you think they can pray for my shoulder? I can't. I'm not working too good. Like, just, you know, rough around the edges. And we're like, well, what do you got to lose? Go back there and get prayed for. And she comes out and like, this blank works. <laughs> like, they don't know they're not supposed to curse, but whatever. I should work. Another guy came who was kind of post-traumatic stress guy. And, you know, he would sit in the meetings with us. And he wrote me a letter. And he said, thank you so much for the love that you've been showing me at this Bible study. I have PTSD-C, and the C stood for the Catholic Church. <laughs> Sorry, that's just the testimony. He just had gotten turned off to church when he was younger. And this guy, you know, didn't know the Bible really well. We were trying to train him and all. And he came to church on a Sunday that was Easter Sunday, not knowing. And he brings in Easter uh, baskets with plastic Easter eggs in them. Now, if you know our church, you know that that's not our focus on Easter is the resurrection, not on Easter and chocolate bunnies and all that stuff. But he didn't know that, right? So some of the people in the church just were not happy about this because they forgot that he wasn't one of us yet. When the kids opened up the plastic eggs, there was a lottery ticket inside. <laughs> So he thinks, like, he's doing this great big favor, like, and this, like, any religious spirit went, ah, gambling, Easter bunnies, like, which would be my position, except that he doesn't know. And all the love he was getting at the cafe got shut down by the reaction that he got in the church. And you could see how it could happen, right? I mean, the people don't want their kids getting Easter eggs and lottery tickets. But sometimes you just got to leave a little on the table and say, look, I know, you're, I know your heart's right. I know you meant well. As you become more familiar with the Bible, you'll understand that these things really aren't the real reflection. You see what I'm saying? What would Jesus do? Get out! Never come back! Uh-uh. No hole too deep that he won't reach down and grab somebody. Okay, so that's, that's my appeal about this feeding hands piece too, right? Because they're not saved. The people that are coming to get the food don't know God. But the people who are giving the food do know God. And that exchange is really powerful. And one of the things that happened, I'm just going to be very practical because I'm out of time, but they've been doing this seven years. They know their population really well. Many of those people have gotten saved through feeding hands because people have prayed for them when they get their food. They all have needs. So if, you're, if you have a prayer ministry team there, and is there anything we can pray for? They're like, how much time do you have? 
There's a whole bunch of things you could pray for me about. And that they do that. They have people there that are just specifically there to pray. But, but the people don't know God. So when COVID kicked back up again, they were afraid to come and get the food if the people that were serving didn't have the mask on. Okay, so some of our volunteers said, you know, I don't want to put the mask back on again. And I understand that. I really do, because I'm not a big mask person either. But, but I want you to just think about it this way. If you wanted to go pray for somebody in the hospital that you really loved, and they told you at the door the only way you can go in and pray for them is if you put a mask on, would you do it? Well, and if you wouldn't do it, then maybe you just didn't really want to pray for that person that much. See? So it's not just about giving them the food. It's about modeling Christ to them. You might say, yeah, but Jesus wouldn't be wearing a mask because he wouldn't need it. But would he put it on to go in and pray for somebody at the hospital? I think he might. You know, I think he might. Because, you know, well, he could just say, I'm going to call down fire if you don't let me up to the third floor. Right? But he said, don't do that. You don't know what spirit you are. The disciples tried that one, right? So I hope the message is not in any way trying to feel like a trap or, or you know, I, I, I was trying to be really careful to show you in scripture I'll finish I'll, I'll finish now you know the ones that were invited to the wedding they all made excuses and they they were not going to come but this is how the message bible talks about this portion of 1 Corinthians 9 we would know the verse when it says I have become all things to all people that I might win some yeah right some all things to all people only equals some not all even for Paul so that means one plants, another waters, God gives the increase, right? You never know. I'm sure there were multiple people who witnessed to you, right, before you got saved. Am I the only one? I was a hard-headed Italian. They needed a lot of work. So this is what he says. Paul, I voluntarily become a servant to any and all in order to reach a wide range of people. Religious, non-religious, meticulous moralists, loose living immoralists, the defeated, the demoralized, whoever. Spirit of God is in me. I come in contact with somebody else. The Lord could show me what he wants me to do if I'm asking. Then he says, I didn't take on their way of life. Could you say that with me? I didn't take on their way of life. Wearing a mask for two hours while you're serving as a volunteer doesn't mean you've compromised your belief system. It just means you're out witnessing to the lost. That's how I'm looking at it. You may have a different opinion. That's okay. You're allowed in this church. I'm not trying to clone myself in you. I'm just trying to give you the perspective. When it's an outreach, you think a little differently than when it's an inreach, when, when it's us all working together. I didn't take on their way of life. I kept my bearings in Christ, but I entered their world and tried to experience things from their point of view. How hard is that, church? On a scale of 1 to 10, this is hard. I'll be honest, because we just get so used to seeing the world through our own point of view. And whatever our gifts are, it's really hard to get in the other person's skin. And I use that word very carefully because that's been a big issue in America. How could you, Peter, as a white person, ever know what it's like to be a black person? I really can't. I've said it. I've used the example with Easter. We should welcome Easter back. She's been out for a while. Woohoo! But doesn't mean we don't try. Doesn't mean we don't talk to each other. Doesn't mean I don't want to know. Right? I do want to know, and I hope you want to know, because that's, that's what you do in the body of Christ. What's it going to look like in heaven? All white people? No, I promise you. No. He didn't have blonde hair and blue eyes either. I promise you that. All right? He was, he was a Jew from the Middle East. Watch The Chosen. You'll see more what he'd probably look like. I entered their world and tried to experience things from their point of view. I became just about every sort of servant there is in my attempts to lead those I meet into a God-saved life. I didn't just want to talk about it. I wanted to be in on it. So if you want to be in on it, come on, let's stand. I'm sorry, I ran a little late. I'm very excited for what God is doing and the opportunities he's given us. And uh, I heard Ray Hughes say one time, do we have any last time visitors? <laughs> Uh, you know, like, brother, did I offend anybody and you're never coming back? Well, it was good to see you. Thanks. Sorry. So I hope, hope nobody was offended by this today. But um, I think part of it, like I said, we could just get too used to being only with each other all the time and forget that we, 
if we really say, I want to love what you love and I want to hate what you hate, then I want to love the lost and I want to hate religion. <laughs> if I could just sum it up in my language, I don't want to be that religious Pharisee. Clearly, those are the people he was the most upset with when he was here. And if we're not careful, we, we can, it can be a, a slow, creepy thing that happens to us that we can become too legalistic and forget, uh, and forget the joy of our salvation. Amen. That's what David said, Rejoice to me, restore to me the joy of my salvation. So one more time, could you lift your hands? We'll just pray. Lord, we're just so grateful for your presence in our lives. We're so grateful other people fought to see us come into the kingdom. So many of us, Lord, people witnessed us, and we weren't kind to them, but they still loved us enough to keep on speaking it and telling us the truth. So we want to be change agents in this earth. We want to be conduits of the presence of God. We want to be people that pour out your presence when we walk in a room and we talk to people and not be judgmental and religious and, and so ready to lecture them about how they should live before we even know who they are, but that you would just sensitize our spirits to, to reach out to people who can never pay us back and to do it on, on faith that your word says we will be rewarded in the coming kingdom, at the day of judgment, when we pour ourselves out for people who cannot return the favor, we are modeling what you did. You poured yourself us out for us, even though we could never pay you back. How many grateful for that? So Lord, we just say, use us this week. As we go about the Father's business in our lives, use us this week. And as we leave here today, that we would be reinvigorated to be about the Father's business in Jesus' name.